people talk about how breastfeeding helps you get back to your original size and I think one of the reasons it is is the contractions that the uterus is having it makes you really bleed and get rid of you know the blood that you need to get rid of there is a relationship between the letdown and your uterus most people have heard of pitocin that's often given to you while you're in labor to help your labor progress your uterus contract so when you breastfeed after the baby your body releases a natural form of pitocin called oxytocin and it does three things it makes you crampy which is the body's natural way of preventing you from hemorrhaging it also makes you thirsty when you breastfeed and that's the body's way of making sure that you're drinking enough because 75 percent of breast milk is water because if you're not hydrating yourself you're not going to get yourself that full supply and the third thing it makes you do is sleepy and that i don't understand the science <laughs> behind that because you don't need help being tired evolution has not figured yeah. out you don't need more reason yet. to be tired but like i'll literally be talking to moms while they're breastfeeding and i can literally see them hazed over and they don't realize that it's because they're literally drugged being a mom is the toughest job there is, and it doesn't come with instructions. So it's okay if you don't have all the answers. We'll figure it out together. This is Mom Brain with Ilaria Baldwin and Daphne Oz. My name is Katie Verbesey, and I've been a maternity nurse for 10 years in New York City. What exactly is a maternity nurse? So a maternity nurse, so they're maternity nurses on the different stages of your labor. So labor and delivery nurse, which is the more common nurse that everyone's heard of is the nurse that's with you during the labor but then after you have the baby for the two to three days that you're staying at the hospital you have what we call a postpartum nurse and that just means that's the nurse that takes care of you in the period after you have the baby so we help you with breastfeeding and teaching and just all the stuff that happens after a baby that you don't know anything and you need someone to be there with you the entire 24 hours doing all the teaching and helping just make you be less scared no it's so funny you're so stressed and focused on the actual delivery and, and I was nobody just, and has then, any idea everything and nobody has everyone's like no one told me any of this and that's none. why I always tell your friends or I tell my patients tell your friends about the after stuff because it's the stuff you don't know and it's the stuff that's going to be what you need for after yes yeah. yes tell no, your friends I and then they with, won't feel alone with and Carmen when be... Carmen was born I was so focused on like the delivery and then I was like everything will be fine when she's out and everything is like healthy and, like, oh, and then I'm like exactly now I have to keep this thing alive oh my god <laughs> all right so I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that you know mo- women will experience you know so say it's my first my first child and I have my my baby and everything goes as planned. So mm-hmm. it's not, you know, a Rafa experience where he was in the NICU. But what are like really common surprises that women have after, you know, giving birth? I think one of the biggest things that moms experience is not understanding how difficult breastfeeding is. That breastfeeding, yes, it's natural that your breasts produce milk, but short of that, so much of it is a learned experience and based on how the babies are and how the moms are and feeling comfortable that breastfeeding takes time. There's a reason that 75% of my job as a nurse is helping with breastfeeding. There's a reason, reason we have lactation consultants that come and visit you in the room and breastfeeding classes. But I think the biggest thing is understanding that if you do want to breastfeed, that it more often than not can take a few weeks to really get established. Mm-hmm. And I think everyone has this idea in their mind from movies and seeing their friends when the babies are months old, right. breastfeeding with absolutely no problem. Right. And people... I think as a baseline from what I've seen is that moms always are going to feel like they're not doing everything right because they see everyone else doing it. And everyone else seems like they're doing it easy, but it's not easy for everyone. You know, I found that one of my... um, So my first experience with breastfeeding is that breastfeeding was more painful than... All of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I obvi- I opted for an epidural with all of my mm-hmm. with all of my births, um, and I did a lot of the laboring um, until the last one, you know, without an epidural, and the last one I was induced. Um, but I I have to say that those like contractions that you get when you get the letdown mm-hmm. from breastfeeding are like no joke. They're really, really, really so, painful. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's another thing that moms will say to me after is that they're in so much pain. So with every, after you have the baby, your uterus has to shrink back down to its original size so that you're not bleeding. So with every baby and every pregnancy, your uterus has been stretched out that many more times. So your body has to work that much harder to shrink back down. So I've had people that have had five, six, seven kids that say the labor, af- the contractions after the labor is worse than the labor itself. I completely agree with you. And that's kind of an amazing thing. I mean, people talk about how breastfeeding helps you get back to your original size. And I think one of the reasons it is, is the contractions that the uterus is having. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll, this is, I mean, this is mom brain. So we get very, you know, 
into the the gruesome part, part, parts, but it makes you really bleed. Yeah. And, and get rid of, you know, the blood that you need to get rid of. Mm-hmm. So every single time that your your body will have a letdown, which is, you know, for those of you guys who are pregnant and, you know, thinking about breastfeeding or, you know, didn't breastfeed one time around and next time. So basically, you know, once the milk starts like squirting, that's what it's called. That's what the letdown is, um, that that is there's a contraction in the uterus, that there's a there is a relationship between the letdown and your uterus. That um, am I saying this right? You are yeah. The, you are so the what the the like the science behind it? So most people have heard of pitocin. That's often given to you while you're in labor to help your labor progress, your uterus contract. So when you breastfeed after the baby, your body releases a natural form of pitocin called oxytocin. So every time you're breastfeeding, oxytocin is released in your body, and it does three things. It makes you crampy, which is the body's natural way of preventing you from hemorrhaging. Because here we have pitocin to give to patients after, but in third world countries and places where that's not available. That's the way of preventing moms from hopefully not hemorrhaging. It also makes you thirsty when you breastfeed because that oxytocin will make you thirsty. And that's the body's way of making sure that you're drinking enough because 70, 75% of breast milk is water. So you want to make sure that you're drinking tons of water because if you're not hydrating yourself, you're not going to get yourself that full supply. And the third thing it makes you do is sleepy. And that I don't understand the science <laughs> behind that because, like, you don't need help being tired. Right, exactly. I because mean, there's you're, definitely something but that as you watch, we haven't figured out. Evolution has not figured yeah, out. You don't need more reason to be tired. But, like, I'll literally be talking to moms while they're breastfeeding and I can literally see them haze it over and they don't realize that it's because they're literally drugged. Okay, this is the thing that would drive me crazy with that. So after having the baby, you're so tired. So and tired. the baby's up and you're like alone in the room and then like nurses will come and I love Katie because she like she'll come and like hang out for like a while and you feel like you're not alone. Um but I'll be like holding my baby and I co-sleep with my babies at home, but like that's like a big no no in the hospital. You're not allowed to do that. Yes, no co sleeping. Uh, no co sleeping. <laughs> no co sleeping. And I'm holding one of my babies and like you're literally like you you eyes just You close. literally can't. You can't. Because and you're then drunk. A, nur- a nurse will come in and be like, are you sleeping with the baby? And I'm like, no, no, I'm awake. I'm awake. I was just closing my eyes for a second. Yep. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you feel like you're getting in trouble a lot of when you're there, yes. which is always another reason that, I mean, as much as I, I love my, ex- I actually really love my experience in the hospital, but you know, you're excited to go home. Oh, well, home, yeah. Who doesn't want to sleep home. in their own bed? But I also just want to like sleep. Yeah. You just feel, you really feel not, like, not feel like you someone's going to catch you every Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's yelling at me when I'm sleeping with my baby in the bed. But yeah, that's actually interesting what you're saying about, and I want to I want to tell you what I do for my pumping schedule because it's a very you guys ask all the time, and it's very different from what is recommended. Mm-hmm. And it's very different from what a lot of people do. But I have four gigantic freezer fulls full of milk, and then fed the baby on top of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what I'll do with all the milk. Um, donate, but I you know I don't think you can donate milk that's already frozen. I think it has to be fresh. Mm-mm. No, not true. Mm-mm. No, somebody told me that. I don't. I think di- I'm not positive on okay. this, so I'd have to check. But I think every like there are different people that receive milk, and there are different they ways different of doing rules. it. Okay. So like if it's like the milk donor bank, it may be different. But I know that like on a lot of like group chats, there are like there's doulas that like will put you in contact with other people. Um, so if it's not like well, you know what? For next time, yes. I will remember that because I literally threw out like four months oh. of milk. I just threw it. Away. I was like, you know what? It's past the six month mm-hmm. mark. And yes. so, and I've been holding on to Research it like a squirrel do- milk donation. with its nuts. Well, because it takes so, it's so hard. It's like. It's hard. I it's, told Alec this time around, I was like, I don't want to push gifts. I don't want, I just want another freezer. Yeah. All I want in my life is another freezer because I, I had need a, to put more milk. I had a patient that was telling, we, we were talking, it was I think her second or third kid. And she was telling me she was going, she was like going on a trip to Europe or something. The baby's like three or four months old. They all went and they were having work done at the apartment or house. I'm not sure when they were gone. And they came home, the painter unplugged yeah. the freezer. That happened like, to me too. In, oh, yeah, an no, entire left freezer. It open. This time she's like, I'm done. Yeah. I'm not doing that. Yeah. No, it's it's, a, it's horrible. It's like uh, somebody all your left hard the freezer sweat and work open the de- oh. and it was just all melted oh. for like a really long time. That's... Yeah, no, but you know what? You just have to say, hey, you I... know what? 
af- after life the fact. Goes on. No, there's definitely after that the fact. Don't in that moment, spilled milk or whatever um, that not thing when is. It's always cry. Always lots and always lots of tears. Always cry. Um, but in terms of the the drinking, the hydration, I find I get so thirsty. You do. So whenever you're... I'm breastfeeding or whenever I'm pumping, I literally before I start, I put you a ha- gigantic yeah. drink and I just like chug it as I am doing whichever activity. Yeah, it's like recommended that every time you breastfeed, you drink eight ounces of water to replenish what the baby's taking from you. And mm-hmm. even more than that, it's better. Yeah, the more you drink, the better. But at least eight ounces every time you breastfeed. And I found different things. Like I found that coconut water helps me a lot mm-hmm. um, to make better milk. I had an experience with Carmen. I So I started, I get um, really bad Braxton Hicks contractions and they'll get to the point where they're like regular. So we got you, a little bit nervous mm-hmm. with them. And I start getting them in like the teen weeks. I started getting contractions oh God, with her at so 19 scary. weeks. Yeah, but it wasn't, I guess they weren't dangerous, but they kind of hurt mm-hmm. and they're regular. And it's and your you first. Think, and yeah. it's my first. I remember I just, my, my family lives in Spain and I had just flown back um, from visiting them alone. Alec wasn't with me. And I, um, I was having dinner with one of my best friends and um, he said to me, like I said, I keep on having these like weird pains every few minutes, and they're like kind of hurts, and I don't know what it is. He says, I think you're having contractions, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my god. He said, you need to text your doctor right now. Yeah. So I te- I texted Sassoon, uh-huh. and he told me he said you need to drink Gatorade. And I run him back. I was like, no, you don't understand. I don't drink those kinds of things. <laughs> I know this is my first baby with like that you're I'm like, in your care, but just so you know. That's me, not me. That no, no, never. And he basically was like, you know, in a much Drink. nicer way. You can get your ass over to the bodega right now, and you're and gonna get, get some Gatorade. And yep. when I say jump, you jump. Yeah. And so I did, of course. And then within like 24 hours, they my stopped. contractions had stopped. So he was very right. But then I learned that coconut water does something very similar. Mm-hmm. So I started drinking coconut water. I don't love the taste of coconut water. Mm-hmm. No. Um, so after, but it's better than Gatorade. For but you. it is better than Gatorade. <laughs> Although the Gatorade really did work very well because yeah. electrolytes. Because electrolytes, yeah. you're just giving yourself a Ex- shot of sugar. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so six weeks after Carmen was born, I stopped drinking um, coconut water, and I didn't. I didn't really think about it. I was like, oh, you know what? I can probably stop yeah, drinking Yeah, because I'm not going to contract. And, exactly. Yeah. Like, it's totally fine. And all of a sudden, my milk went down. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what it was. I didn't put didn't two make and the two connection. together. Because mm-hmm. you're too tired. Because I was too tired. And I wasn't. And nobody had ever told me that coconut milk um, or coconut water was good for your milk supply. And then I forget what happened, but I just, like, I had one in my bag, and so I drank it. And then all of a sudden, I had more milk again. It was really, like, very, very sudden. It was interesting. And then I put two and two together. Fast forward to so you've been drinking know, coconut for five years. Ex- coconut water for exactly five years. Coconut water. I have it like in stock. I know. I know. Now I, I make, remember like, you smoothies. having it. In the house, I yeah. make like smoothies out of it now because I'm like I still don't love the taste. Um, but fast forward to when we used to have vacations and go on vacations. We don't do that anymore because I have too many, too many children, children. And I would prefer it's just not to sit in my house and stare at the wall. All if your I have crap make. is in your house. Exactly. No stre- vacations and end up being stressful proof. or like somebody gets sick. And we had to cancel three different trips this this spring. Well, you were like you pneumonia. With the last, I had with pneumonia Romeo. with with Romeo. Oh no, it was so bad. It was so bad. So I um. So I I went to we went to the Caribbean, and um, and I I got there and I you know I they the women there were like saying they're like oh do you um are you breastfeeding I'm like yeah and they're like you know what you guys up there like you know, yeah. say you guys up there don't know that um you should drink coconut water I was like actually I do I have a full supply actually I do and I've already ordered to my room I felt like very cool that I knew yeah. that I knew that so now I want to talk about that experience of being sick do you see that often of like people having to go through labor and everything and being sick and then the most fascinating thing is my baby didn't get sick because all of the antibodies that your body's building up you get they have from you and then if you do choose to breastfeed those antibodies are passed through your breast milk to the baby so that's why we always tell moms if they have the flu or if they have if they're sick with some type of virus it's always better to breastfeed during it because it's counterintuitive to what you think you're like if I'm breastfeeding and I'm super close and I'm to my super baby. sick like I shouldn't be feeding my baby right or breathing um, on your baby or breathing on your baby but I mean if you don't have to be around your baby at all then like 
don't go near the baby, but that's right. not not the reality right. of the life of having a newborn. So if you st- you're going to have to be around the baby, the best way to protect the baby from whatever you're doing is to is to give that breast milk to them because the antibodies are passed through the breast milk. And that was, I mean, I know that you you told me that, and Sassoon told me that, and everybody told me that. And even though this was my fourth kid, I was. So and so sick that I was like, this is. I mean, it's just going to be bad. And then you and you're emotional and you're oh, yeah. somewhat irrational. And 100%. I literally was crying, saying, "I am going to make my baby sick, and he's going to die because yeah. that's what's going to happen. Because I'm so sick right now that if a little baby got this, he will die because that is what's going to happen. And those are the facts. And your hormones and you're are like, all over, and you're irrational. And I'm like, and... I'm a horrible mother. And there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and that is the the end. Um, and it was actually kind of amazing. So I had pneumonia and my... But you didn't know that initially. I, I didn't. I was so sick, yeah. though. I got pneumo- I had pneum- I got diagnosed. So he was born on Thursday. I got diagnosed on Monday after. Um, but I, you know, I hurt my ribs because of God. all the coughing. Like the last thing and it, you was, it was really, like, it was a lot. And then my, my kids got the flu. Oh, of course. Yep. And Carmen came home with pink eye. So my boys, my two middle boys got the flu and Carmen came home with pink eye. So I literally... Always what you want with a newborn baby. Exactly. I literally Quarantined. separated. I mean, we live in, in uh, you know, New York apartments where you often, like, you have, like, multiple apartments together. Um, and so we'll have, we have a separate apartment next door um, that's, like, they have, like, a little playroom and everything. And we have our like living apartment so i literally kept the baby in the separate apartment and i and i had kept like, my guys, three so you know i had kids. the baby but you're not going to see well, the they, baby no, for they, two weeks one rafa said to me after like a week he said mommy what's the matter you don't want your baby anymore and i said no he's here you just haven't seen you're him. just you not allowed have, to see him you have the flu but i would wash myself with dial soap change my clothes go feed the baby he would go to sleep go back deal with my sick kids Having pneumonia with that, it was oh like, God. I literally was like, what What have I done yeah. in a previous life, life to, that, warrant to, to this. deserve this? But the most amazing thing, I mean, at the end, you know, I've, I'm have i grateful and I'm happy because he did not he get didn't sick. Get it. And it was the most. All of the insanity was worth it. Yeah, you, he didn't the, get If the sick baby gets a like, fever in the first two months, back to the hospital. Yeah. No, I can't. Guaranteed. I can't even imagine. Mm-hmm. I can't even imagine. It would it would that would be completely heartbreaking. Leo got sick when he he got pneumonia when he was 3 months old. That was the youngest that any of my kids have gotten sick. Mm-hmm. And it was horrible. I mean nebulizers for months yep. and months and months and months. So my breastfeeding schedule so you can see that we like jump around here a lot. Yes. Yeah. There's no it's complete train it's of right. thought. I never say um, on one topic. For, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fortunately this is called mom brain so we can not make sense sometimes. Um so my breastfeeding schedule so what I did I did it very um, normally with the first one as one does mm-hmm. because it's your first child you and you listen to everybody and you do exactly what they say. And then because Rafa was in the NICU, I pumped a lot. Mm-hmm. I didn't pump with Carmen until she was there. yeah, two until, to three weeks. No, well, I not think even it longer. was like because I, I went back to work six days after okay. she was born, so I pumped then because I was and I was also doing like a photo shoot and she was around and every single time. I had, like, this high dress on, and every single time she would, like, be near me, she just wanted to breastfeed, and, like, I couldn't, like, be taking my dress on and off. So, they're like, well, why don't you pump some milk? So, it was the first time I pumped milk, and she had no interest in the bottle. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. It's like, it's the opposite problem that people can get <laughs> with breastfeeding babies. So, my coworker is taking six months off, and at, like, at four and a half months, her daughter literally would not touch the bottle. Like, pitch to fit and so she had to stop breastfeeding essentially and start pumping and because when she went back to work her poor husband who was taking paternity leave was not going to be able to feed the baby so it's like a I know isn't that interesting because then they'll say that some some people are worried to introduce the bottle to them because then they're like oh this is so easy and they're not going to want the breast I always found that my kids wanted the breast more than the bottle Mm -hmm. Um, I had two of my four kids would not take a bottle and then my other, um, and I would, you know, they started having pumped milk like in cereal and stuff like that. Or if like I was really gone for a few hours and they were really, really like wild and hungry, they would like be like, Eventually, fine, fine, fine. Like, exactly. Conceived. But it was really difficult. Every baby's different. It's recommended to not to start off with the, if unless there's a medical reason, babies in the NICU, to wait a few weeks to give the bottle just until the breastfeeding is fully established. Right. Just because the way they suck on the bottle is different than the way they suck on the breast. So that's once, there's really, there's a school, I'm sure as you've seen, Everyone has an opinion on everything. Mm -hmm. There's really no right way to, as long as you're feeding your baby, there's no right or wrong way to do things. Because what works for one of your, if you have twins, what works for one twin isn't going to work for the other twin. So you really just kind of have to listen to what everybody is saying and then take from that what works best for you. 
because there's just not one way to do things. Right. One right way to do. There's wrong ways, but like as long as you're feeding your baby something exactly. and taking care of the baby, whether you choose to breastfeed or bottle feed, like you're up with the baby at three o'clock in the morning. They're your baby. It's your decision. You're, you're the boss. That's you're the boss. That you don't like, have. I know, and it's kind of funny. You feel like you're like you know trying to make everybody else happy, especially with your it's first one. Your, exactly. Yeah, but like that's the thing I was trying to tell about. So I'm like. Because there's so much, like, and yes, breastfeeding is great because you pass the immunities, you get all the bonding. But like, if if you don't want to breastfeed, that's perfectly fine. Or it doesn't fun. work or out. Or it doesn't work, or you decide you or want to do breast bottle, like whatever you want to do, like you should feel okay to do that because it's your baby. And that's like, there's so much pressure with the breastfeeding. So many moms like say they want to breastfeed, and like we can very quickly tell like if they actually want to breastfeed or right. if they feel like they have to breastfeed. And I just wish it's. I wish people didn't feel like they had to. Well, it was interesting. With, with Rafa, I had um, I got pregnant with Leo when Rafa was six months old. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons I, I've gotten pregnant with each child breastfeeding, obviously not Carmen because I was, didn't have a kid before that, but with all the boys, I got pregnant while breastfeeding. It is not birth control It is not birth control. People Let think that it be is known. not birth control. <laughs> Let that be known. You can get pregnant while breastfeeding. Um, and I, um, one of the reasons I knew I was pregnant is that my milk all of a sudden like plunges Mm -hmm. down, like even before I can take a pregnancy test. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I was very stressed that I found out I was pregnant when my child was six months old. (laughs) There were definitely some tears. I mean, obviously there was like, then I'm like, of course I'm going to love my baby and I'm so happy he's here. But you already have a baby. You have two babies. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Well, Or one and then. Yeah. And then two and then three. No, Carmen was, yeah, pretty, Carmen was pretty little at that point, um, too, because Carmen and Leo are three years apart, exactly three years apart. I continued to breastfeed because with Rafa and Carmen, so with Carmen I stopped breastfeeding her within a month of getting pregnant with Rafa because I was told that it's not good. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. I've come to the conclusion that I don't believe that, but I really, really freaked out with that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then so I said, you know, if this ever happens again, I'm going to continue to breastfeed. So I continued on, and eventually my milk went away by the time I was like four months pregnant, Mm -hmm. so by the time he was 10 months old. And I didn't. I had some stored up, but I didn't have enough. This is why I became a this squirrel became afterwards because the I was hoarding, exactly, I hoarding am pumping all the milk. Um, and he. So basically, I had to introduce formula to him, mm-hmm. and it was this idea of like the walls are going to come crashing in. All of a sudden, he's going to have this, that, the next thing, sick for life. It's going to be really bad. And he was, he was fine. fine. Entire generations of the seventies with breast the formula like Yeah. And people are fine. I mean, of course, I know as we talked about with with Romeo not getting sick, there are some amazing things with breastfeeding. But one thing I say to women who either can't or don't want to is it's it's absolutely fine. This does not mean that your kid is less. This does not mean that you are less. Happy mom is happy baby. You do what works for you and what works for you is what works for your baby. End of story. A hundred percent food is you're gonna be miserable and it's the worst experience and like then it's not worth it to the baby and then also fast forward to two years and your kid is at a birthday party eating like you know some like horrible food coloring yeah uh, so much crap so much crap and then you were like stressing about everything being super super organic at the beginning so um so yeah that's that's that whole thing of you know is if breast is, is is breast best when it works for you. Yeah. And then if, if it's it doesn't what you work want. You, exactly. So back to my pumping schedule. Okay. So what I've eventually learned. Eventually we'll get this eventually out. Eventually we'll get it out. <laughs> it's like we're teasing it along the way. Um, so what, what I basically learned is that um, even though I don't introduce a bottle right away, it, it does feel very free to know that there is milk in my freezer. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah, because you have the freedom you to. You have the freedom to go because. Before that, you don't have the freedom no. to go anywhere, like anywhere. anywhere. What if the baby needs you yeah. and he or she is hungry and then it's like really bad and you're the like panic. really – Exactly. It's horrible. So what I learned is emotionally it's nice to have, you know, even just a yeah. few packets of milk there. Because you never know. Because you never know. The other thing I find is that it actually helps my milk come in mm-hmm. to be pumping and be feeding. Another thing I learned that at least from my body and then other people I've – talked with who do it the same way is that my body responds or my body responds differently to a baby versus a pump oh for sure so they always say to you pump uh pump after you feed Mm -hmm. which is very discouraging to people because if you pump after you feed you're going to be pumping for like a good 30 minutes and maybe you're going to get milk and maybe you're not and you're really going to hurt your nipples so what i would do is and almost any time 
that my baby was hungry, I would go and I'd pump for anywhere between one minute and three minutes. Mm -hmm. And even if I don't get anything, but eventually it actually immediately starts to come in Mm -hmm. and then I'll go and feed the baby. And the baby would get milk on top of that Mm -hmm. because you're kind of, you're tricking your body, you're training your body to work a certain way. It's supply and demand. Right, exactly. But if I did it the other way, then I would not get milk from the pump. So if I did baby first, then pump, I would not get it. Mm -hmm. And you know, if, if the baby's hungry and he has to wait a minute, it's okay. Baby. It's literally 60 seconds. Babies cry. Babies cry. Um, yes, babies cry. Babies cry. It's okay. It's, it, um, one of the – a woman who, who has helped me take care of our kids, she says uh, – she, she's so funny. Um, she's from Jamaica, and she's, like, the queen of our castle. Um, and she, like, we're all, like, running around, like, trying to make her happy all the time. Uh-huh. <laughs> she's, like, the funniest person in the world. And she, um, she said to me at the beginning, one of the best pieces of advice was no baby ever died from crying. No. Crying. That being said, of course, if you want to go to your child and help If they're breathing, they're crying. If they're what? crying, they're breathing. Exactly. Exactly. So, like, when you get really stressed out because your baby is crying, take a deep breath. Everything is going to be okay. And then you'll be able to assess what the baby I always say, in the needs. end, you always win. Really? Tell me. Which is what I'm saying. In the like, if babies are crying, in the end, the baby will stop. The baby will You're stop. You're gonna win. Exactly. In the, the end. In the end. It's gonna. It's going to be not okay. to ne- not to negate how stressful it is when you're exhausted and you're crying, right. but just like. You're like the baby's crying to tell you something, and like you're gonna, and you start to figure. You start it to out. figure you it start out. To say, okay, like, this cry means yeah, the, like you know, this. Tired. Oh, she's, this one, she peed. hungry. She yeah, needs exactly. the diaper change. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so what I would so basically with my pumping thing, it's coconut water is a must. Eating, I'll eat like a lot of high fat things. I'm, I'm I love like different bars that have lots of nuts in them. I'm a big nut eater. Um, any like lots of proteins. Any kind of like fluid that I can get my hands on, mm-hmm. I definitely will will take it because I'm so thirsty mm-hmm. all, the time. all the time. And then again, I just try to pump really, really regularly. Then people will say to me, "Well, what about washing the parts all the time? Like that's exhausting." So what I'll do is I'll pump, and if I don't get anything from them, I just put them in the freezer or the mm-hmm. fridge just as is with like the pump parts. I use the Medela pump, and then I um, and then the next hour I come. And I'll put it back on and pump again. If I get milk out of it, I'll pour it into something. And then I put the, the same pump part. So I really only wash the pump parts one time a day. Mm-hmm. And if you keep on putting them into the fridge, it's okay. And then once I get three to five ounces, I'll freeze a bag of that mm-hmm. of that milk. Um, so it ends up being, you know, teaching my body to produce more milk. Um, and, and then it feels you know, free that mm-hmm. I can go out. And, of course, you know, I, you want to be close to your baby when your baby is just born. But it allows you to feel a little bit more like your own person. Yeah, that you can not be attacked, not feel trapped. Exactly. Exactly. And it's that amazing thing of like my body will respond to a baby differently than a pump. I've even used before when it felt like I couldn't get the milk out for the pump. I'll put the baby on one side Mm -hmm. and then the pump on On one side on the other. And immediately it starts to let down. And then the baby gets like really pissed off when I literally hand him to like Alec. And I'm like putting the pump back on the other side. I'm like, you can wait two minutes. (laughs) And they're like, what? That was a tease. Yeah. But um, all right. In terms of you know, what are other some some other really common questions that are that are asked postpartum? What about like in terms of the amount of bleeding and stuff like that? So the bleeding can so you bleed for up to a month. It's not going to be as heavy it is in the first like twenty four to forty eight hours that you have. Usually in the first twenty four to forty eight hours, like you can have like decently heavy bleeding. We always tell moms if you're saturating more than a pad an hour or any large clots, you definitely want to like call for your nurse because at that point you're in the hospital. Um, and then after you go home, the bleeding will definitely be a lot less kind of the end of a period, but between say 10 to 14, your bleeding will often pick back up and be bright red again, which is often scary to moms because they're home and they're like, why am I having all this bright red blood again? It's normal. It's just the body's changing and everything's happening in the uterus. But again, if you're saturating more than a pen an hour, any large clots, any foul smelling discharge, definitely give your OB a call. And even if it's call, if you're concerned, like that's why they're there as far as stuff with OBs and especially with pediatricians, I always tell parents as they're going home, like, if you're ever concerned, call. Like, don't wait. Don't worry for hours and hours and hours. That's why pediatricians are there for stupid, normal newborn mm-hmm. questions. Like, I guarantee you they've heard the question before and, like, far stupider. Like, if if you're concerned, call. Like, exactly. There's – and you – 
it's probably nothing, but what if it's something? Let's right. call them. And just in terms of your own stress level, you should never feel feel embarrassed that no. you have a question. Like your intentions are, I want you're to take good parent. care of That's my your, child. You're the parent. You should never feel no. bad Ask for that. Ask the questions. They've heard it all before, uh, about I promise the, you. About the bleeding, we need to talk about the layering of the pads. Oh, yes. Because I learned really great things about that. And diaper I have ice to packs. say, yes, diaper ice packs are like my favorite thing ever. I learned from my friend um, th- uh, when I had Carmen, she said, you are going to want to buy a very small um, trash can that can you can keep right next to your toilet in the bathroom when you go home that has a lid on it. Mm-hmm. She said, because you're going to bleed afterwards. Oh, yeah. And I had like before like this very like nice like wicker thing that was like open to the world. Yeah, no. And she's like, you are just nope. going to want to like close press it. that button and then close it. <laughs> yeah. She says, and you want to change it many times a day. You want to pretend but it's not I there. I literally to this day still have that same little trash, trash can. can there. And I think about her every single like, you know, time I walk by it because I'm like, she was right. That was some of the best advice ever. A close top trash can um so okay so layering layering was like one of the best things ever so uh, well first of all i am you know not that kind of i know that some women are like we'll go to the bathroom together and like like at a party and like oh let's go pee together you, I'm like, you would no, be alone in the bathroom i'm not one of those people yeah. i'm like i need two minutes to pee especially now being a mom I'm you like, have that's your only no time alone ever come with me it's your only well, time it's no usually you I still have, like, have either someone, kids sure. with me or like they're peeking under the door um, but so I remember when I had Carmen and then you go to pee for the first time yeah. and somebody comes with we you do. and it's really I know. awkward I know. and I was like, oh my God, I don't know if like, I just obviously pushed a baby out of my vagina, but for some reason, peeing it's a different, in front of I know is re- and they're like, you know, with like, they, we have to measure strain it and measure it. And you're just like, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. But mom, it, people pass out the first time they pee. Really? Yeah, that that's why we do it. No, I'm glad for it. Yeah, I'm glad because for it. Because first of all, it's to teach you in the moment, in the like moment really but it's out. to teach you like all of like the peri care and the pads and the sprays and like all of that stuff. But also, often moms like after you pee, then you pass then out. Then you pass out. Mm-hmm. It happens like pretty regularly. Wow, that's never happened to me. You do feel like A woozy really and woozy and off balance and everything. But I remember this this woman who one one of your coworkers who um, came with me to pee the first time and then I didn't see her for like a few years I think I saw her like maybe Rafa was a baby Mm -hmm. and she came up to me on the street and I you know then you're in different clothes and you don't recognize yeah and um she came up she's like I took care right care of you right after Carmen was born and I started like crying of course you're the one who helped me pee (laughs) and she was looking at me like okay I kind of regret coming up (laughs) to you because you're literally like embracing me and talking about how you peed for the first time with me but it was like such a vulnerable moment oh yeah and then since then I've gotten I've gotten better at that yeah it's hard because like we can like everyone's different with that like sometimes some people don't care at all but other people like it's hard to pee in front of someone and then you like you feel the pressure and it can take you a little while to pee that first time because of the catheter and all that but it's so like it's we always like try and like I usually turn the water on so there's yes, noise. Yes, you guys always turn the water. Turn on. the water yeah. on. Yes, yes, and yes. And then yes. like make conversation. And I always make moms bring their phone in because like if and with anything like once you're fixated on like having to pee, yeah, then you can't pee. And then so I'm always like look at your phone and it distracts oh, you and then it re- no, relaxes I, I'm your a big body. Believer of don't bring your phone into the bathroom because God forbid it falls into the toilet. Yeah, my, they often leave my, it, but I, I'll, like, that's, that's go. If, if moms can't that's, pee, I go get their phone for that's them. That's years of working at a yoga studio, and you have no idea how many how many phones we had to fish oh, out sure. of a toilet. Yeah, it's a very, Because they, very like, common. put it in their They side. put it in their yeah. back pocket the back. and then pull their pants down, and then it flips and into the toilet. And then you're fishing So I phones. just don't, like, don't bring your phone into the bathroom. Um, You need you need a minute to yourself. No, my, my thing when, like, the peeing is, like, I'll just, like, st- like, pretend that I'm like totally fine with it like uh-huh. I'm like yeah I'm like this cool like open person yeah but no, inside but I'm no like problem. oh my god oh my god oh my god someone's in here and I'm trying to pay <laughs> now and now I've gotten more used to it after after four kids okay the layering of the thing yeah so which hazel is so, a must yeah so we and we give I don't know about all hospitals I don't want to speak to all of them but most hospitals will provide you a lot of times moms will like bring their pads or mm-hmm. bring all that stuff most hospitals provide you with all of the stuff you're going to need so we have like everyone lo- everyone's obsessed with like the underwear you get from the hospital oh, I call it hospital thongs like you can't buy it anywhere else so it's wonderful they're comfortable like you can throw them away mm-hmm. they're stretchy so we have the first we have the underwear and then um, we call them chucks but it's like they're the, the, the dog the wee pads, pads for a dog pads. yeah mm-hmm. we call them chucks but yeah the wee pads so we usually use the wee pads 
pads like on the bottom because in the beginning you can have a lot of bleeding and you'd rather not have to change your underwear every Correct. time so that the chucks will catch it. And then there's the diaper ice packs, which are wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, it's essentially for people that don't know what diaper ice packs are. You literally take a diaper from the baby's bassinet and you open it up in the middle, like shove ice in and it works as an ice pack and a pad because normally the ice packs, if it's like the ones you pop, it doesn't absorb the blood and it's like a disaster of like mess. So you use the ice pack and the pad, the diaper ice pack. And then we have witch hazel pads, which you usually will then line on the top of the pad. Mm -hmm. And that helps if you have hemorrhoids or just swelling. And it's just like a really nice thing. If you have like, if you have a fridge in your room, you should put the witch hazel pads in the fridge because when they're cold, it feels even better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we use Dermaplast, which is like a that numbing spray. spray. That oh, spray. The spray is so the good. The spray too. is wonderful. And then um, also like a little peri bottle, a little squirt bottle that you can fill with warm water and then use it to rinse the blood away because you don't want to be wiping too hard and using that will decrease infection. And using it while you pee mm-hmm. that can is help better because it won't, doesn't sting as much. Yeah. That, one, that one's like a really. But the squirt bottles is something you always want to take home and use that while you bleed because mm-hmm. it decreases no, it's, infection. It's, yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Everyone I loves it. I always like now at the point I've like learned to where to find these things. Uh-huh. And like even though I know. I'm going to be at the hospital. I like it's part of my nesting because I'm a huge because you need to like feel prepared. I like need to have all of my stuff and I have like a whole box of like my things. Mm -hmm. Um, and you just feel prepared, you feel ready. Although I have to say, the first one was the hardest, it's the only one where I had an episiotomy, Mm -hmm. and then the other ones I didn't. And it wasn't like it was literally like a couple days later. I mean, other than the bleeding, it was like not a lot has happened on there. Mm -hmm. Everyone, you're lucky, more more people. It's more common to have a lot happening and in a lot of pain. Oh, no, of course. But I'm saying the first one it was. And then after. It I'm, gets, because generally with every baby, gets, the yeah. labors are easier and, and like less traumatic. And you can push them out more quickly. Push them out more quickly. Um, and yes, like, no, it was a definitely. You hope to make it to the hospital, some people. I don't know. I'm I'm also lucky. People people will say like, oh, my labor was only two hours, and I'm like, I'm happy for longer labors because again, I'm a planner. We're in Manhattan, and I exactly, and I want him to be in exactly the, th- the right room, <laughs> exactly everything going on. My doctor has to be there. Everything needs to be going just as planned. Yeah, so you don't want the fast labors. I don't want the fast labors. No, no, no you don't no. want the cab baby. I, no. Do oh, Alec, can you imagine? No, I no. can't imagine. We, no, no. This is why I don't invite him, just yes. in case anything happens. I feel like you'll have plenty of time to meet the baby you'll later. You'll be fine. You have plenty of time to meet the baby later. Um, going back to the whole breastfeeding thing. Mm-hmm. So also, um, there's these cool gel pads that you guys yes. introduced me to as well that you can put on your nipples. Yes. Those are amazing. Those are wonderful. So yeah, those you can get. And if you're using lanolin, you don't want to use the gel pads and the lanolin too. So it's essentially, for people who don't know, it's like kind of like a little silicone type yeah. circular pad. Is that because they'll, they'll slip off? No, it's just like because of like what's in both of them, they're not oh, recommended. I didn't know that. So you would put them on your breast right after you breastfeed, and then you would just you can use like you don't have to wash it with soap and water after the gel pad, but you would just like rinse it off with a washcloth or a baby wipe or something mm-hmm. like that before you breastfeed, and then you can use them for like six days. You just put them back and forth in the fridge in between feedings, and they're wonderful. They're amazing. And then the lanolin is also another good thing to use if you're not using that. But in the beginning, if you express colostrum and rub that on the nipple, it actually works better than lanolin, just because the colostrum mm-hmm. has all the good stuff have, in you it. You know what your body is like. Like all prepared for all yeah. these things. It's like you don't really need a lot of the bells and whistles. Mm-hmm. That's so interesting. Now, what about mastitis? So mastitis is when a milk duct gets clogged and it can lead to an infection. So it's really good to be aware of if you have any swollen, red, or tender areas on your breast or overall achy like you have the flu, you definitely want to give your OP a call because you can feel like crap really quickly with mastitis. Um, and if you ever do feel like you have like a clogged duct, not that's warm or tender, but if you feel like you have like a duct that's not fully emptying, as you're nursing, it's good to massage that spot to help loosen it up or sometimes change the position, the way the baby's feeding so that they'll empty um, part of the breast differently or empty I, in a different way. I had, for the first time, I had mastitis like really, really bad with my last one. I mean, I really think that my body was just so depleted from pneumonia. From, from life. Absolutely everything. So on top of that, just gave I you kept one more on getting, thing. exactly, I kept on getting mastitis over and over oh. and over again. And I, and it comes in a triangle. Mm-hmm. So it literally like the red, the red mark looks like a triangle from it's kind of pointy where your nipple is and then comes out and it can be like in multiple places or um, both breasts, one breast. Um, and you really feel like y- you have a low grade fever. I would shiver a lot. Like, yeah. it was like my bones And it happens hurt. really quick. Really, really, really quick. Um, and what I found is just like a lot of hot, hot pads and just pushing. I mean, as much as you don't want to do it. Because it's painful. Because it's painful. Always. If you have mastitis, you always have to nurse or pump through it because mm-hmm. people 
think that you shouldn't, but it's it happens when you're not emptying your breast fully. So right. if you aren't emptying, it's not going to help the problem. Right. So always nurse during mastitis. You just continue. Or and then and push while you're pumping, push while you're nursing, go into the bathtub and push yeah, it. Yeah, warm before to help massage everything yeah. and loosen everything up. Yeah. And then what did I do? Is, is, do you take Motrin with it or something like that? You can take that? Motrin. Sometimes you, you can also need antibiotics yeah. too, too. Although I tried antibiotics this last time around and it, it didn't did work. not Work. Yeah, just talk think, to your OB. I think it was just my body was just. You're probably already on a ton of antibiotics. I, yeah, I and, I, my whole, but generally, like you do want to call your if you think you have it, definitely call your OB because you often do need, need antibiotics. To go on antibi- absolutely. Yeah. No, I think my my thing was I just, just needed to get. There was so it. much other stuff. There was going on. so much other stuff going on, and my poor body was just you know was done. Really, really, really unhappy. If your if your child, you know, if your if your baby does go to the NICU what are some what are some things that that you would want people to to know it's if a baby has to go to NICU or anything happens it really it's a terrible thing because it's just again it's going back to it's not what you expected right um so the one thing you definitely want to do if you are wanting to to if you do want to breastfeed the baby but you're not able to breastfeed initially because the baby's on oxygen or something's going on you can't breastfeed you definitely want to start the pumping pretty pretty early on because it's all a supply and demand. So you want your milk supply, your full milk supply doesn't come in for three to five days. If it's your first baby, it'll likely be closer to that five day mark. If it's your second or third kid, your milk comes in much quicker just because your body's done it before. Um, But so if you're not able to be stimulating with the breastfeeding, you really want to kind of get on a pumping schedule and you can talk to your your nurses like this is all we do. So talk to your nurses, talk to lactation consultants and have them get you a pump really early on so you can start pumping. You want to like be on top of your pumping every three hours um, to get that milk supply to come in if breastfeeding is important to you. Right. Um, And then... Yeah, I feel like that's like the most important thing. If your baby is separated from you, continue to t- to tell your body that your exactly, baby is still there. Exactly, and your milk supply will come in, and your baby will get latched on. And there's so much out there about like if the baby isn't put to the breast and breastfeeding's not going to work, like the baby will in the end, like you'll get the breastfeeding working, even if the baby has to get bottles in the beginning or. You guys will figure it out. It's yeah. just you're starting it a little bit later, but breastfeeding still can work. Like that's an important thing for moms to know. If you can't breastfeed in the beginning for whatever reason, doesn't mean it won't happen. It doesn't later. mean it won't happen. You know what's funny about it as well? You know, I mean, we talk on Mom Brain a lot about mom guilt, oh, and so and everything feels like it's our fault. And I have to say, from having four different kids, who yes, Rafa was in the NICU for a little bit. They took Carmen away right away. Like they didn't put her on me right away because there was some meconium in her mm-hmm. water and they just wanted to make sure she was okay. She was hundred percent fine. And then Rafa or sorry, Leo and Romeo, they put them on my chest right away. And it was like the most amazing thing. But it was, you know, my third and fourth kid were the first times that that happened. Yeah. And um and you know, so much for, I, be, even though they had very similar things where I breastfed them from the beginning and everything there there is that feeling of like you know moms can say oh well my my baby was in the NICU or my baby was taken away from me or I didn't you know keep the the cord attached for x number of seconds or I didn't do this so it's all my fault always and in the end I feel like if people should just release themselves a little bit of that guilt society puts all this pressure on because that's what everyone's telling you to do and what you have to do. And if you don't do that, like, you're not a good mom and it's just not the case. But that's that's the whole thing that we wanted to do here on Mom Brain was simply provide lots of different options. And we'll have guests on with different opinions and stuff like that. And we're never like, okay, this is what no, you have to do. No, because it's not. Exactly. It's, it's Every kid is different. Every family is different. Like, it's just you have to figure out what works for you and not feel bad for doing what works for you because it's your family at the end of the day. Like... You do what's best for you because that is what's best for your baby. Okay. I know that we have to let you go, but I do want to talk about the magic of the swaddle oh, because let me tell you something. Swaddling is key to life. It's close. Okay. Swaddling is key to life. And even though I've had four kids, every single time I watch a nurse like swaddle my baby for those like two days that I'm in the hospital, I'm like really kind of jealous because I can't do it like you guys no, do it. No, do you know how many times I've been recorded of like doing the swaddle? I it's just, I mean, I've been doing it for 10 years. I think just the more you're doing it, people love like the Velcro swaddles. I'm terrible at the Velcro swaddles. Like I can't do the Velcro. But yeah, figuring out some variation of swaddling, whether it's like with the 
like a, a blanket that doesn't have the velcro, some sort of swaddle is great. So the reason babies love to be swaddled is for nine months they're inside your stomach and that snug feeling of not being able to move is how they feel safe. secure and mm-hmm. safe. And then babies also have a, uh, we call it the moral reflex, but it's a startle reflex. So their nervous system isn't fully developed when they're born. So if they hear something or a, a loud noise, they jump and they startle and they wake themselves up. Mm-hmm. So being swaddled helps prevent them from waking themselves up. No, it's amazing. They make them like that, and they look so cute. They're like these little, little burritos, like, yeah, little tiny burrito. It's the cutest thing in the world. And I the remember- moment like you finish, they they'll freak out while you're doing because they're they don't want to be like messed with. And like the moment you pull that last thing around, they're like, oh. <laughs> I'm okay with it. it like, it that's what you were really, doing. It's really cute. I rem- I think I had told you this of one of them. But so Leo didn't pass because they did his hearing test, like, very soon to his morning. He didn't pass his first hearing test. Which is test. also pretty common for Which I heard is common, when but freak- when they tell you that, I know. you're it's, like, oh, no. I know. It's just so, the fluid retention in the ear. And they had the someone ears. come in, and she was just like, he didn't pass his his test and I'm like ready to cry of and I'm like what so that entire night because of that reflex the the, the startle Samora. reflex I was like you loved it because you knew making <laughs> I was like making sounds and like really like like fast high pitch sounds like clapping all this kind of stuff and I was like did he move or did he just move in that moment I was like researching so you proud, know yeah. sign language I was like okay. by by the <laughs> throughout the night I was completely fluent in sign language no I'm kidding um and then in the morning they came and did the same test and, and they're like he's fine he's fine he's fine i guess the other thing you helped me out was r- with romeo's name yeah oh Remember my that? god i had the no struggle idea was what his name was but it had blankets there. with a different name on it <laughs> it was name was supposed to be diego yeah diego you had blankets yeah, and then I had blankets and, then and towels wasn't and one of them asking chair? like when he came home yeah, like Ra- where's diego rafa was like where's diego okay great you brought this baby home but what happened to diego where's this guy diego and i was like i well you know what he didn't look like a diego his name was romeo yeah so oh, that was that a, was that hard was... and everybody was very against the name romeo too because they were like oh he's gonna be like made fun of so much and i'm like whatever yeah, but yeah, that was the struggle was real. The okay. struggle, the struggle was real. <laughs> Katie wrote on there the, was like the, a whole uh, list, like, yeah, of like all these different names and different combinations, and she like wrote it on this whiteboard, and I just like was like staring at it for two days, pretty much. <laughs> and then there's that moment where you have to write it down. You You're have like, to okay, hand the birth certificate I'm before committing. you leave. <laughs> we literally have parents that are like filling out the birth certificate in the wheelchair, like uh, yes. as they're leaving. Yeah, I, I, I believe it. 